Good morning again to, to everybody, in case uh, there's some, be some, been some new guys since I started. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, we're going to be hitting the audit programs today. Um, so just very, very briefly a recap of what we've done. We've, we've set up our engagement. We have uh, done the necessary planning. So we've gone and, and, and identified risks within the audit and that's what the planning section is all about, gaining a knowledge of the business and finding those risks. Then we assessed those risks um, and uh, went and decided what we're going to do about those risks, whether we're going to do specific audit procedures for those risks or if we're going to um, just let it filter through to our audit plan. We've gone through the audit plan, that was the whole of last week, we just looked at the audit plan, going and understanding what we now do with those, how are we going to test those risks, are we going to be doing uh, substantive analytical, substantive tests of detail or cost, uh, control testing on, on all those risks. And um, once we've done the audit plan, uh, I have done the process already, but uh, what we would normally do is go and populate our audit programs. Um, I've already done that, so my audit programs are in place. But in case uh, anybody's, anybody's missed that, um, to populate audit programs, you can open up any worksheet uh, within RAC, and you'll see that there is a RAC tab available um, in your ribbon bar, and then there's a populate audit programs button. Now, if I press it now, uh, nothing's really going to happen because I've already got all my audit programs in place. But if you do press it and nothing seems to happen, your audit programs are not being populated into your RAC file, the, there are a number of things that could cause that. It could be that you haven't assigned all your components to a cycle, and that's in document 10.20, or 12.95, very important document, 12.95 um, has not been signed off and uh, approved to allow the population of audit programs. So those are just two things to look out for. If you don't sit with audit programs in your file, that is why it's happening. Um, and um, as, as we've mentioned before, uh, RAC was, was the first methodology we modernized. Audit Light Plus, our Attorney's Trust methodology, very soon our Accounting Officer Plus methodology, all of those also have an audit program population process that takes place from this RAC toolbar. So uh, do look out for that in future. If you're looking for audit programs that are not there, please hop onto support if you if you can't work out what's going wrong. Uh, generally in all of those there is some guidance. But now we are uh, in my RAC large client and we're going to start taking a look at this audit program that we have. So I've just opened up the Fixed Assets and Investment Property Audit Program. Now if, uh, if you've got very good memories and you can recall the details of what we did, um, this goes back to I think week two, we went and allocated or we indicated that we have property plant equipment and depreciation. Uh, my apologies if it's a little bit small, just maybe make it a little bit bigger so that you can see that. So we now have an audit program that has more than one component being covered. We're looking at property plant equipment and depreciation in this client. And that is what the whole cycle based audit approach is all about within RAC is we're putting multiple components in one audit program. So when you have a procedure, just look at this first one, it's about lead schedules, it's telling us which components this procedure is actually covering and then it also goes on to show you all of the assertions that are covered by any particular procedure. Now this is RAC large, so we have all 14 assertions. So let me zoom out a little bit and you can see that there are a lot of assertions to which we can allocate each procedure. Okay, and we'll come back to allocation of procedures in a moment. Firstly, just the layout of the audit program. I have deliberately skipped the uh, guidance sheet. Go and read the guidance sheet in your own time. It is fairly detailed uh, and we do try and help you out as much as possible. Um, I've also specifically at the moment skipped the stratum sheet. I will come back to stratum once we've had a look at the detail of the audit procedures. Then we've got the audit procedures sheet, we've got a change in audit approach sheet, and we've got an assertion sheet. 
we're going to start with the audit procedure sheet. I want to hit you with the bad news first. Um, the most difficult part and most difficult way in which to prepare an audit program so that you understand why we're doing things. So that when I show you all the shortcuts that we have introduced within RAC, um, then you will very quickly uh, well, at least you'll understand the background of what's happening. So that if you're asked the question, you're not left speechless as to what on earth is happening in our audit programs. So the first section of our audit program is standard procedures. Now, um, the procedures that we have here relate to our lead schedule, our accounting policies, the completeness and accuracy of the population, and that's also specifically referring to lead sheet and for when you are dealing with any samples, do you have a population that you can actually sample from? Um, these, all these procedures are kind of required up front. You, you need to perform these procedures before you can really start auditing a section. What you'll also note is that very often there is um, no assertions actually specified because what we're saying is that these procedures need to be performed irrespective of the level of assurance that you're getting and these don't actually add overall assurance to your audit there are just additional procedures that you need to do to make sure that you can audit in the first place stratum and desired level of assurance and I'll go through what those are you will note are gray when you're dealing with the standard procedures, these are not applicable. There's nothing applicable um, about stratum um, or desired level of assurance. You just need to go and do these procedures and they cover all components. Everything here will automatically be yes. There's no option really to say no. Scrolling further down procedure four, a couple of notes I want to make about the procedures we have here. There's a procedure on every single audit program related to journal entries. Now, journal entries specifically are found under Section 20. There is a journal cycle audit program. Sorry, there are a few extra templates sitting in my file. Um, I create files of our master rack template. There are a few backups of certain files. So there's a journal cycle audit program specifically for journal entries. So the point of Procedure 4 on your audit programs is not that you must go and look for journals and test them. It's just stating that if you do come across material journal entries and other adjustment journals um, in other procedures that you perform within this section. So we're dealing with PPE, you are testing for instance additions and you draw a sample of additions from the general ledger and one of those happens to be a journal and you pick up the journal and you note that it was uh, debit PPE with a million rand credit repairs and maintenance with a million rand. So you've got a journal in your sample. What Procedure 4 is stating is that where you have these additional journals, go and do these additional procedures. So go and document this information somewhere on that working paper because then when you get to your journal section, when you get to document 20.20 20 .20 and you're testing journals, you've already started reducing your sample size for journal testing. So in journal testing, we're talking about 50 journals that need to be tested every single year and they're broken up into different types of journals. So there's 12 year-end journals, 12, there's a, there's a whole string of, of ways in which you go and select those journal entries. But we're already reducing that sample of 50 by testing these items. Think about, for instance, expenses. If you draw a sample, very often you're going to pick up a journal somewhere in your testing, go and document the initial, these, this information, then you don't have to go and think about how we're going to extract and which journals we're going to test because you've already selected some for testing. All right. Procedure 5 and 6 relate to reviewing the general ledger and sub-ledger for any large, unusual, non-recurring transactions. 6 is specifically transactions outside the normal course of business. And this once again comes back to what ISA 240 is telling us about significant risk. We have got to go and consider any significant unusual transactions. We've got to go and look through the GL. So both the journal entries and these unusual transactions are both dealing with what we spoke about in ISA 240. We have that ISA 240 template 12.70 which went a step further and looked at um, revenue recognition and estimates. But here are the other two elements that ISA 240 are telling us about. So that's the first section 
standard procedures. I didn't know what else to call them. The next one is tests of control and I'm just going to zoom out a little bit again. Here you will note that uh, we've got a lot of blue cells. There's no defined procedures under tests of control. The reason is we cannot design a standard test of control for you. Um, it's, uh, it's impossible for us to do. You need to go and design the test of controls for your client individually for each, for each entity that you're auditing. But please take note that the cells are blue. Therefore, if you document these procedures in detail this year, they will be available in your audit file next year. So it is worth documenting good procedures where you do need to go and do that. All right, scrolling a little bit further down, come back to why those red cells are there. The next section is substantive analytical procedures, exactly the same as the, as the tests of control. We cannot specify analytical procedures. Okay, then we get to substantive tests of detail and finally we can go and put in a number of standard procedures. And I'm going to scroll quickly, depending on how good your internet connection is, you may or may not see very much of what I'm looking at, but there are a lot of procedures. At, uh, at one point you will see that the procedures move away from properly plant and equipment and are now showing uh, depreciation. So there, there's, a, there's a sudden change from one component to another. So that's already built in. All of this is specified for you. Okay. And then going a little bit further down, let's get to the end of the substantive test detail. There's once again a lot of blue cells available that you're able to use to go and add your own custom procedures. We then go to substantive tests related to business risks. So here under fixed assets and investment property, we've gone and specified that there is a procedure that we're going to do specifically to address one of the risks in our business risk register. So that is pulled through automatically. It also determines the level of assurance based on what we documented in those procedures. Okay, so what's not showing at the moment is substantive tests related to um, fraud risks. Uh, there's obviously not a fraud risk procedure that we've specified in our uh, fraud risk register to pull through, but this is where those two sections would appear. And then we have under action four audit conclusions. Okay, now under each section, and I'm going to start with a substantive test of detail, you will note that there is a table presented below each. So under test of controls, analytical procedures and detailed tests, we have this table. And there are a number of red cells in place. Okay? Now, what these red cells indicate is, and, and the numbers that it's generating is actually directly off our audit plan. So in our audit plan, we said for property plant and equipment, for the assertion completeness, we need to get level two assurance. So that's low to moderate assurance for completeness. Everything else has got a 1 in case you can't see it very clearly. So everything else is at a low level of assurance. And that value has pulled through directly from the audit plan. If I want to change that value, I actually have to go and change it in the audit plan. I'm going to scroll up a little bit further, go and look at the table below my substantive analytical procedures. In my substantive analytical procedures, everything except existence is sitting with a level one assurance. And I want to point out that these are the account balance assertions. Because we're dealing with large, the account balance is separated from class transaction. And that's why there are only red cells sitting under the account balance. And here are the class of transactions. And uh, that is why there are only red cells under the class of transactions assertions as well. Okay, so just so that you can see uh, why those red cells are sitting in different locations. And also under tests of control we have the same, but there are only tests of controls for my property plant equipment. There are no tests of controls required for depreciation. Okay, now when we initially designed the uh, audit programs and the procedures, we came across, for instance, under our substantive test of detail, I just want to scroll to it, repairs and maintenance. 
inspect repairs and maintenance expenditure accounts for the period and determine whether there are any material items that should have been capitalized. Okay, so we're dealing here with additions to property, plant and equipment. But when we start auditing PPE, we're actually sitting with a fixed asset register. So additions is something over and above what's sitting on, on our fixed asset register. It's an, it's an extra item. We're actually going through the repairs and maintenance account. And what we realized as a result of this is that within each component, properly plant equipment for instance, there are multiple stratum or could we call them subcomponents within an audit. And our audit programs were not catering for this. And the, the issue is that we then end up with a procedure like repairs and maintenance. We're saying it's, it's covering completeness of my property, plant and equipment. But what about other items? What about unrecorded, um, completely unrecorded additions or, or uh, maybe assets not included for whatever reason, removed from my fixed asset register. So there's like a sub portion of property, plant and equipment additions. And that's why we brought through the concept of stratum um, within our audit programs. And I'm going to go over to our stratum working paper. Now, I am in rack large at the moment. And when I look at the stratum uh, sheet, you will note that um, there, there's very little completed in the section that I'm highlighting now. Okay, Whereas if I go to one of the others, additions and disposals, so on medium, small and micro, additions and disposals will already have a yes indicated under, uh, sorry, whether we want to make use of that stratum. So what we've basically just done is this stratum sheet uh, gives you the option to go and design and use stratum as you feel is appropriate. For large, we're wanting you to go and make that decision. So do we want to make use of additions? Do we want to make use of disposals? And we do recommend the use of these stratum. It does make the audit process a little bit easier to, to work through as you go about it. And you'll see as we start populating the audit program a little bit more um, what, what is behind that. We then do have one additional question about how we are going to gather evidence for stratum. Because we have decided, for instance, for property, plot and equipment, that we want to do some control testing. But is that control testing going to be valid for additions and disposals as well? Do we actually want to go and test controls for additions? Or are we just going to test control for the PPE fixed asset register balance? So in the drop-down list, the two options that we have is that we're going to test in accordance with the audit plan or are we going to do just substantive test of detail? So those are the two options that we're giving you to be able to go and test this. So for one, I'm going to say audit plan. Let's say for additions, we'll follow the audit plan. But for disposals, we're only going to do substantive tests of detail. And I want to show you what impact this now has on my audit program. You can also go and modify the assertions that are covered by each stratum. We don't recommend that, but you can do that if you are sure that um, you may. Okay, so please just be very careful if you do edit this, that you should be editing it in the first place. You can also go and add your own additional stratum, and uh, situations where this could be applicable is, let's say for instance, revenue. If your client has multiple sources of revenue and you'd actually like to go and perform different procedures for each class of revenue, then you can go and specify the stratum underneath uh, on this sheet and go and specify, let's say for instance, um, sales of equipment from services for instance. Um, if you want to go and test those differently because the control processes within the business are so different that you want to test them separately. Okay, So you go and make your determination about stratum and then we come back to our audit procedures. Let's just scroll down to the table below my substantive tests of detail and you'll see now that there are additional rows in place. So we have additions and disposals now available beneath property, plant and equipment. But property, plant and equipment still has its own items. And uh, the distinction we want to make um, here is that the primary portion of your component is always going to be the top line. 
So fixed asset register you're going to test under property plant and equipment and it's going to remain there. You don't need to go and make a separate stratum for the fixed asset register. Let's take another example, say for instance trade and other payables. You have a fairly big balance on your financial statements and that's all one component. However, within trade and other receivable, uh, sorry, trade and other payables, you have trade creditors, you have sundry creditors, you have accruals, you have leave accruals, and all of those you may want to test separately. But your trade creditors sitting on your creditors ledger, you would still leave under trade and other payables as your primary component, and the smaller parts you will take out to go and specify separate procedures for the sub-components. So that is, that is the process, that's the decision process around stratum, just to try and separate out those little things that sometimes get forgotten. So you get a procedure, select a sample of trade debtors, trace it through to statements, that's all very well, but what about sundry debtors? Have I tested sundry debtors in that same procedure? Did I include them in the sample? Was it possible to select them? Or have I just forgotten them and ignored them basically in the audit process? which could leave you open to exposure of risk, especially if those sundry debtors become material. Okay, so now we need to go and get these red cells to not be red anymore. Let's go up and I'm going to start with the tests of control. Okay, now under tests of control, firstly I just want to point out, you'll see disposals does not have any red cells. The reason is we said disposals, we're just going to be doing tests of uh, test of detail, so there are no control procedures required for disposals. But now we need to go and design a procedure. So in any one of the blue cells, let's go and document a procedure. All right, and now we need to go and say, are we actually going to perform this procedure? You'll initially note that there's just an X presented under the number because we, we don't know that we're going to perform this procedure. At a later stage, we sign off the planning and we're actually going to hide any not applicable rows in the audit program. So I don't want to generate a number until you say, yes, we are going to perform this procedure. So let's go and change that to a yes. Let's perform it. Now I need to specify which components am I going to cover. I don't need to cover depreciation, so I'm just going to cover property plant equipment. Okay, now what assertions will I cover? Please be careful about selecting completeness and existence. Usually those are two very different, difficult assertions to cover with one procedure, unless it's maybe a very good analytical. Let's go and select existence for the first one. Now you will note only the account balance assertions are available for selection because I've only selected an account balance component. If I select a depreciation, it immediately opens up the class of transactions assertions and it's yellow because I haven't selected an assertion yet. Okay, take that out for now. Now I need to go and specify what stratum I'm going to use. And if I hit that drop down, you'll see that the options available to me are additions, disposals, a few blanks because there were some blank items that I didn't use and then all. Now if I select all, it's going to apply this procedure to all the stratum within or within that one component, okay? And once I've selected a desired level of assurance for this procedure, let's go and make it a two, because I do need a two for existence. You'll see it immediately takes away the twos under property plot and equipment and additions, okay? Now I want to document another procedure. All right, and let's just say that this is a multiple step procedure, okay? And initially what it'll look like is that this, these are separate procedures. If you are wanting to link a procedure, simply go and type an A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth into the second column next to the number, and that will then see this as one procedure. The yes automatically populates on the subsequent rows, and now we want to go and say, again, this is for property plant and equipment. This time we're going to do for completeness. I'm going to skip stratum and I'm going to say desired level of assurance is one. Okay. Now when I leave the stratum blank, the assumption is that the procedure is covering the primary component. 
the primary portion of the com component. So this procedure is going to address my uh, fixed asset register. Okay, so I'm going to leave it blank, leave the desired level of assurance as one, but I've still got to go and do another procedure for additions. So a third one, and I'm going to say yes, I'm going to perform it. It's properly plotted equipment. Let's just say, for instance, this covers completeness and valuation and allocation, but we now want to specify that it is for additions, and we're going to do it at a level one. Okay, what happens now is we end up with a minus one under the valuation and allocation. And the reason is, is that I've now selected additional procedures or uh, additional assertions that I didn't initially need. Okay, now it could be um, that you want to document that anyway. In this case, probably you would only document completeness. But what we'll find as we go is we'll see more of these minus ones. Uh, we'll see bigger minuses, and I'll explain that when we get to the substantive test of detail. But at the moment, I'm happy. My tests of control, there are no red cells left. Okay. Let's go and move to my substantive analytical procedures. Once again, the process is identical. So uh, let's document that procedure, am I going to perform it? I'm going to perform one of the world's best audit procedures that is going to give me uh, assurance over every single assertion of depreciation and uh, property plot and equipment, and it's going to cover all the subcomponents. I'm going to do it level one, and you'll see it magically removes everything. Okay, if you do come up with that magic procedure, please let us know, we'll include it. Uh, but this is just for demonstration. You need to go and make sure you're covering all of your assertions. Now we want to get to the test of detail, and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated because we do provide you with a number of fairly detailed procedures, but you need to decide which procedures you're actually going to want to perform at the end of the day. Okay, now if I scroll to the bottom, let's have a look at the table. A lot of red cells sitting here, and um, I just want to point out something I didn't note earlier under the audit conclusions. You'll see that there's a big yellow cell at the bottom here telling me that the planning of the audit program does not comply with the audit plan. And that cell is going to remain yellow until every single red block is removed from my audit programs. Okay, so now let's go and document the procedures that we want to perform. Okay, I'm going to say, Yes, we're going to do the closing, balance and additions, and we're going to do desired level of assurance one. Okay, next procedure, measurement, desired level one. Okay, I'm just going to run through these. I'm basically just going to the top row, and you only need to document desired level of assurance and the assertions on the top row, so please don't think you have to go and put a one and a one and a one and a one. Uh, you can just document it on the top, the stratum as well. We only look, when we look at completion of the audit program, we look at what's documented next to the number. That's the row that we're going to capture information on. You'll see there's a red, uh, sorry, a yellow cell here, and I'll come back to why that's yellow in a moment. Let's go look at impairment, desired level of assurance, one. Um, Disposals, one. Restrictions, one. Now we get to additions. You'll see that we've automatically populated the stratum for you in the standard procedures. So you don't need to go and specify that this is for additions. We've already selected that for you. Okay. Insurance policy, presentation and disclosures, and borrowing costs. Now, this is, for instance, a good one to consider carefully. Are we capitalizing borrowing costs? If we don't capitalize borrowing costs, then we probably don't need to um, do this procedure. So that's why you can't just necessarily go and say yes to everything. You do need to go and specify in some cases. Um, leases, once again, if there are no leases, we don't need to do the leases procedure. Exchange of non-monetary assets for another is another procedure that you're not going to do too often, I suppose. Um, and then we get to depreciation. Let's go through the depreciation items. So I've just gone through, in case you haven't seen everything I've done, I've just gone and specified a yes for every single um, procedure. 
and uh, said the level of assurance is 1. But when I get to my table, you'll note that we're still sitting with a number of red cells. Now, firstly, valuation and allocation, we're sitting on a minus 4 at the moment. Now, the major reason why we're sitting with a minus 4 is because we've gone and specified borrowing costs as a procedure, which impacts valuation and allocation. We've gone and looked at leases. We've gone and looked at uh, a number of additional procedures that are over and above what we would do just on the fixed asset register. Now, initially, we ended up with minus 8 and greater than that when we did this, and that's why we went for stratum. So we've tried to include those stratum which make as much sense as possible in terms of additions and disposals. Maybe you want to go and add additional stratum to reduce this, but the point of that minus 4 is to warn you in case you really are over auditing, but it doesn't necessarily mean we are over auditing because we're minus 4. Just go and consider what procedures you're doing. Am I doing excess procedures that I maybe don't need um, before you sign off and send the clocks out to go and test uh, borrowing cost capitalization for instance and there is no capitalization. Okay. What we're trying to prevent is a situation where you go and decide that everything is going to be at a level 4 assurance for instance and I scroll down and suddenly we're going to sit with minus 7 where it was minus 4 before. So we're just wanting to try and prepare uh, or, or prevent a little bit of over auditing where we can although it doesn't mean, uh, like I say, the, the minus does not mean you definitely have made a mistake. It's just warning you to look. Okay, now we've got to go and deal with these red cells. And what we've done to try and make this process a lot easier, and this was only recently released as an update, is we are highlighting next to each procedure what, what assertions are not yet fully covered. So if I scroll down, it's going to find the first procedure, we get to completeness. Okay, and it's highlighting the yes incompleteness for me so that I know that this is a good procedure to go and increase the assurance on because I've not yet obtained all the completeness assurance for property, plant and equipment. So I go and I increase this one to two, the yellow's gone away, so I know I've increased it sufficiently to now cover completeness of property, plant and equipment. Let's scroll to the next yellow items. Okay, we come to disposals. All right, disposals, there's a lot of assurance outstanding. Because we said disposals, we're only doing substantive test of detail. So let's increase it to a 2. All right, you'll note that there are still yellow cells. Existence and completeness is still not yet adequately covered. So let me increase it to a 3. Still not covered. I need to do some more. Desired level of assurance, 4 and now I'm happy. So completeness was a level 4 risk for disposals, so that is why we now need to do this procedure at level 4 assurance. Okay, let's scroll down. Any more yellow ones? Yes, here's my repairs and maintenance. Let's go and increase it to a 2. That deals with it, with it appropriately. Presentation and disclosure. Increase it to a 2. Yes, that's sufficient. The yellow cell goes away. And let's go and see, everything else seems covered. Hopefully my table is, and it is, it's all white. So I have covered all of my risks with appropriate procedures. Okay? You will note, for instance, disposals. We do sit with some minuses. There's a minus 1, a minus 2, a minus 2. Why are we sitting with minuses here? Because we had to do the completeness procedure with level 4, and that completeness procedure covered other assertions as well. Therefore, those other assertions are being over-audited, but I'm not doing excess work as a result of, of, of that. I have to do this procedure at a level 4, and that's why you are, in this case, getting those minuses. Now, I've done my planning, and it tells me my planning has been completed adequately. So the yellow cell is gone, so I know that everything that's red has been sorted. And now I can go and confirm that these procedures were customized as necessary to respond to the uh, assessed risk of material misstatement at the financial statement and assertion level. Why? Because I've cleared these tables. That's what the audit plan and, and interaction, the, how the audit plan interacts with the audit program is we've assessed the risks, we've carried those risks through, we've said how we want to address the risks, and now I've gone and selected appropriate procedures.
Okay, applicable audit procedures are designed to address the specific significant risks and that comes back to my business risks um, and my fraud risks and also if you've had a very significant or if you had a level 4 risk come through for instance on the completeness, we have designed appropriate procedures because we've ad addressed them with the audit plan decisions that we've made. So we can sign that item off. Okay and all applicable audit assertions were appropriately addressed in the audit procedures. Once again, we can sign this off because yes, we have covered all of the assertions of all of the components, including all of the stratum. Okay, I can't sign off as reviewer yet because the procedures have not yet been performed. This is the process you now need to go through for all of your audit programs to go and decide what procedures you're going to perform. You can go and decide on your own substantive procedures as well, so if you don't like our procedures or if there's specific stuff you want to cover at your client, you can go and design your own procedures and document them in the same way as you've done for control testing and uh, for uh, analytical procedures, but that is the process in terms of planning the audit program. Okay, and I'm going to come back later to this rack large and we're going to look at one or two other things. But now that you know the difficult way of doing the audit programs, let me show you the ways in which we've tried to make life a little bit easier. And I'm going to start by going to my medium client. Okay, now medium client, sitting at my audit program, the first thing you should note is that the number of assertions is greatly reduced and that was the difference between a large and a medium. Okay, Assertions go from 14 to 7 and um, you still sit with a fixed assets and investment property audit program so that is still the same because we're still following the same cycles as a large client or we've changed the assertions. Okay, Let's go and have a look at the stratum sheet. Now in this case stratum is automatically populated with a yes for you the additions and disposals. Okay, we're trying to make it a little bit easier. So there, for all the procedures that we have designed in our database that have stratum attached, we will automatically put a yes for you. So if you say yes to any others that are not yes under medium, you will need to go and design your own procedures for those stratum because they will not be covered in our audit programs. Okay. So those are selected yes, but you still need to go and decide will I do audit plan or will I do substantive tests of detail. So that's in place there. Okay. Go to the audit procedures. Now everything happens in the same way. Okay, just note it looks like my um, audit plan in this case is slightly different. So the same risks are not pulling through. Um, but we would still need to go and document for substantive test detail what procedures we need to perform. However, if you know what our procedures are and you want to save yourself the time of going and doing a yes, desired level of assurance one, yes, desired level of assurance one, we have included in the stratum sheet a lovely little button to auto select all methodology procedures at level one assurance. So it gives you the option to automatically go and populate everything for you. Go to my audit procedures and you'll see there we go. Yes. Everything has got a yes. Everything has got a one. All right. I have still got outstanding risks. All right. So it's just going to put a one next to each. So I need to go and make that decision. So what additional coverage do I need to get? But then again, you go and you just use those highlighted cells to go and document what you need to cover. That procedure, a two is sufficient. Move down that procedure. Two, three, no, it's level four risk on completeness. Sorry, I'm very quickly going through that in case you're not following. I'm just gradually increasing the desired level of assurance each time to go and re remove all the highlighted cells. Okay. All right, I've done all the changes that I need. My table is clean. I have no outstanding risks and my planning has been completed adequately. Okay, so that's, that button is available in large as well. 
the, the or should I say the selection to auto select is available. Um, it does make life a lot easier, but you may still need to go and for instance, let's go and look at uh, where are those uh, funny ones. You may decide that, oh, now I can't find my leases procedure. More haste, less speed. Okay, exchange of non-monetary assets for other assets in accordance with IAS 1624. Alright, if you don't believe that that's necessary or applicable, alright, say no, I'm not going to perform that procedure and you'll see that it removes the number from the procedure. Okay, alright, let's go and have a look at what happens with a small client. With a small client, once again, the stratum are automatically selected. But what you will note now is that we're not in a fixed assets and investment property audit program. We are in the statement of financial position cycle audit program. So we, something has changed here. We are no longer sitting with PPE and depreciation. We're now sitting with all the balance sheet items. And that's the step from medium to small as we go from cycles to balance sheet income statement. Okay, You still have the stratum automatically selected. Uh, we can still select how we want to get our evidence. Note under trade and other receivables we have only got impairment accruals selected with a yes. So that's the only one that's got uh, pre-selected procedures. The other stratum are just examples you can change them if you don't like them. Just go through the others. That's all in place. When I look at the procedures, sorry, I just want to scroll down. Okay, there are some completeness items on cost of sale. Oh, sorry, on um, control testing. But I've I have not selected automatically select one. That's still sitting with a no. Okay. But my audit procedures already are automatically selected. So in small, you don't even need to specify yes. We automatically assign um, a yes and a one to every procedure. You still need to go and document the highlighted yellow, increase some of those procedures, and then just go and take out any that you feel are not appropriate. From small to micro, we are still again sitting with the standard of financial position audit program. But what happens now is we still also auto select all the procedures, but you're guaranteed to sit without a table, or sorry, with a clean table because um, there can only be low risk. So once we've done a level one procedure, you've covered all the risk under every item. So remember for a micro client, the assumption is as soon as there is a risk, we are going to document a specific procedure to address that risk um, in the um, business and fraud risk registers. And that's why if I scroll a little bit further down, my substantive tests related to business risks, there are a heck of a lot sitting in here because I had to go for every single risk, document a procedure. So there's nothing on my audit plan and then all the risks are low. Okay, so as you get smaller, it gets easier, but that little stratum Oh, there's a little option under the, the, the stratum specifically for your medium clients is going to make life a little bit easier to go and pre-populate those items for you. All right, I'm going to step back into my large client and uh, that once you have gotten to this point where your planning is completed adequately on all your audit programs, you now need to go and sign off your planning. That is the end of the planning process. And there's a planning sign-off document uh, called 1800, and uh, that is where we're now going to go and sign off the planning. And what this uh, spreadsheet will do, what this working paper does, is it goes and gathers the data from every single one of our audit programs to verify that my planning has been completed adequately. Now, I have not gone through them all. I did a bit of a fix on um, the trade and other receivables. Uh, we, if we've got time, we'll go and have a look at, at that one. But I now need to go and confirm, have all the planning documents been completed? All right. Second question is, have all audit programs been adequately populated? And to confirm that yes, have a look at what's sitting in all of these. And only the applicable audit programs are going to appear here. So it's not going to be um, 
for instance, if you don't have biological assets in this case, there's not going to be a biological assets audit program. Okay, and then has the engagement partner given permission for the sign off of the entire planning section? Okay, now we've not said the partner must sign this off, we've just said the partner must give permission because we know that there are some partners who don't want to necessarily interact with the file or you might be at the client and the partner can't get hold of the file. So we are giving you an option to just say yes um, without an actual sign off so that we don't stop the audit process but hopefully you you're at least got that email to say yes you can sign it off. Okay, once we've answered those three, sorry, the, the last question here is just related to the revised materiality calculation. Uh, there's also a revised materiality template, uh, 1805, just in case materiality needs to change during the audit and it's just again giving you an option to lock that down for any further changes in the trial balance should you wish to. I'm not going to change that now. It's the first three questions that we need to go and say yes to um, in order to finish the planning. What that does, if I go back to my fixed assets and investment property audit program, is it has changed the layout of this document slightly. Okay? We still have the procedures, but instead of a whole lot of columns for components, we now just have the components listed. Instead of a number of assertions um, in columns, so we just need to wrap this text. Ah. My uh, fingers are too fast for my computer. Okay, it lists the assertions covered in in a cell, so it just goes through those assertions. Okay, stratum is still there. Desired level of assurance is there. All right, and we now can go and put in reference to work done. So the clerks can now take this file, go and put in their hyperlinks, add any comments and very importantly we need to go and find out was the test successfully carried out and the desired level of assurance obtained. Now as a firm you need to decide who completes the cell. Is it the clock? Do they, are they allowed to go and say yes it's successful or do you want to do that as part of the review process where the manager or partner goes and s decides only once they've reviewed the procedure whether or not they're happy that uh, the procedure is um, completed and that's just a simple yes no and you will see that we've highlighted the, only the first row again of each procedure so that you don't go and say yes to everything you only need to say yes to row one and sign off. Okay, all right the other thing you will note is that there are no extra blue lines there are no additional procedures we've gone and hidden everything that is superfluous on this page. So any procedures you've said no to or any blank lines we've removed so that the not applicable stuff doesn't get done by accident. Everything else is hidden. Okay, let's go through, um, finish the other procedures. Okay, gonna go through, say yes to everything so this audit went very very well. Okay, once I've said yes to everything, okay, and obviously I would go and do the procedure for business risks as well. I now at the bottom here get a new block that appears and it's telling me that execution has been completed adequately. Okay, because I've gone and I've done all of those procedures and if I get to the final sign-off document which we'll look at in a week or two's time, um, it will tell me execution has been completed adequately. However, what happens when for instance this procedure fails? We're not able to perform the presentation and disclosure procedure for depreciation. Okay, we have conclusions here. Alright, tester control is telling me the desired level of assurance has been achieved. Substantive analyticals has been achieved. Test of detail, we've not achieved it. Why? Property plot and equipment, disclosure, additional one. We, we, we're short some assurance because a procedure has failed. Now what we don't want at this point is for you to go back to your audit plan and change your audit approach. 
because then we can't see and follow uh, as a reviewer how that decision to change the audit approach was made or and what you've done. So now we leave the procedure as no, this procedure has failed. Let the reviewer know that the procedure, procedure has failed, but we're going to go and do a change in audit approach. And that's what this change in the AA is about. It's not about joining Alcoholics Anonymous. This is about a change in the audit approach. And what this sheet will do is it will open up any component and go and identify exactly what is outstanding under each component. And the assumption is that if you do document a procedure or a strategy here to deal with this outstanding assurance, that it, it, it has been achieved. So you're not going to go and document something here that again fails, because if, if your next procedure fails, then you need to qualify. Okay, let's go. So you go and document your procedure. You say what level this risk will be addressed at. So in this case, it'll be a one. Go and put a hyperlink to the actual work. Which assertion is covered? It is disclosure. And you will see at the bottom of the table, all of these are now grayed out. We go back to our audit procedures. Go and look. The conclusion still shows that there are outstanding issues. It tells me still that execution of procedures has not addressed all risks, but it does say that the change in audit approach has been completed adequately. In other words, I have gathered sufficient audit evidence in order to complete the section. And uh, basically, in other words, my property plant and equipment is audited. I can still see the process. I can still follow the logic behind what has happened in the section. I can still see that there was a failed procedure and what we did to address that so that when we get to it next year, you've got some history. You've got some understanding about what went wrong. And maybe you'll design the second procedure first instead of trying to do the first procedure. All right. If your procedure does not work or Let's pray, for instance, you're going to go and say no. In fact, it doesn't allow me to say no. If you're, if you're still left with a yellow cell at the bottom remaining outstanding for the overall component, what effect is this going to have on my audit report? Okay. Is it a scope limitation? Is it a qualification? Is it a disclaimer? What are we going to do because of this failure? And uh, we document that here, and then we can also go and in the finalization phase, go and pick this up and go and document the reasons for the failure of the disclosures of depreciation. Okay. So that is audit programs, the change in audit approach. We do also have an assertion sheet. It's just a definition. So if you're not sure what the assertion means, um, it's for clerks who maybe want to go and understand what's happening. There's just a disclosure of a uh, definition of each of these assertions. So there's nothing major there. Okay.